Understanding our ponds. The ponds in this story we are referring to are those we find in our neighborhoods and roadways. These ponds are actually stormwater ponds designed for a specific purpose. In an article in Stormwater Magazine by Drescher, Sanger, and Davis, they said this, Stormwater ponds were originally intended to manage localized flooding. However, over the past decade, they have been increasingly expected to, or in some states required to, address water quality concerns for receiving waters, including the removal of pollutants, including nutrients, bacteria, inorganic contaminants, organic contaminants, and other sediment. In addition, stormwater ponds are often used for recreation, to enhance the aesthetics, to increase property value, and to provide wildlife habitat even where their intent was strictly for stormwater management. They also provide a source of fill material for site construction in low-lying areas that would otherwise raise development costs. Over time, we have come to expect these stormwater ponds to perform in ways that they were never intended. It is clear that they struggle to keep up with these demands. People residing on some of these ponds have complained about unsightly algae blooms and dead fish floating on the surface of the water. The reality is these ponds have become nutrient storage facilities, not nutrient removal systems. To get a better understanding of what's happening, let's start by looking at a healthy pond. In a healthy pond, there are three types of algae, benthic, epiphyton, and phytoplankton. Macrophytes are big plants in our ponds that take out nutrients. Nutrients enter our ponds in several ways. One way is diffusion. This is where nutrients enter from the soil on the bottom leaching into our water column. There is another natural source of nutrients called exudates. This is where nutrients leave the macrophytes escaping from their plant tissues and enter into the water column. In the first scenario, the benthic algae layer takes up the nutrients coming up from diffusion on the bottom. In the second scenario, the exudates are taken up by the epiphyton that will grow on the plants. As nutrients start to come into our ponds from outside sources like runoff, there is now an abundant source of food for the phytoplankton suspended in the water column. It now has a source to thrive, and this is where we will start to see nutrient overload. This overload is experienced as humans start to become more apparent on the scene. At this point, all three types of algae have excess sources of food. The benthic algae has a source, the epiphyton has a source, but now the phytoplankton also has a steady source of food. So the phytoplankton increases. As it increases, the benthic algae is already covering as much as it can. The epiphyton is covering as much as it can. With this overload of nutrients, the phytoplankton spreads, causing shading to increase, and gradually the pond gets worse and worse. As this shading increases, the macrophytes and the benthic algae start to suffer because of less light. But the nutrients still continue to come in, and eventually the plants and the benthic algae get shaded out and die. The bottom continues to diffuse nutrients into the water column, and the runoff of outside nutrients are still flushing into the stormwater pond as well. Now, the phytoplankton is the only set of algae that exists in any great number. Shading from the excess phytoplankton increases, and the stormwater pond becomes what we call turbid. Floating algal mats sink to the bottom. This is where they are broken down by bacteria. This action depletes the water of oxygen. Fish will die and nutrients re-released into the water. The more algae that sinks, the more this will occur. Over time, suspended nutrients could eventually settle to the bottom of the pond and become locked up in the soils, but with the simple action of heavy winds on the surface, they can quickly be resuspended into the water column. Because there is no benthic algae on the bottom and no plant roots to stabilize the soil, any good wind action will resuspend the nutrients, providing food for phytoplankton. The question becomes, can we solve this? Can we fix it? Can we reverse this turbid lake? Let's start with chemical spraying. Is the solution to spray it away? No, it would actually make it worse. Let's explain why. This spraying does not just reduce the phytoplankton, 
It kills most of the plants, including the desirable, epiphytic, and the benthic algae. So if you kill all the macrophytes and the good algae, you start over with the same problem. With no benthic algae, no plants, and no epiphyton, the phytoplankton will thrive. But just before the phytoplankton bloom, there would be a momentary clarity in the water. Then after a short period, the cycle will begin again. Unfortunately, there is nothing to take up the excess nutrients except the phytoplankton, and this is where the problem repeats itself. So, instead of fixing a turbid lake, preventing it is the right approach. Don't wait until it is so bad that it becomes turbid. There are other misguided methods of control that have been considered in the past, like using triploid carp, dredging, and fountains. Triploid carp are indiscriminate and eat everything, including the desirable macrophytes and the benthic algae, and will eventually have the same effect as the chemicals. Dredging is extremely expensive, and it basically means starting completely over from scratch. Fountains move water around, but they typically move water from just below the surface back to the top. So very little of the water column is effectively being circulated, meaning it is the same difference as a slight wind blowing across the lake. There are options that work. Aerators are an effective tool, used to move air from the bottom of the lake to the top of the lake. This helps move oxygen-rich water to the bottom of the pond, so nutrients will once again precipitate down into the sediment. Another effective option is littoral shelf planting. This is a typical macrophyte planting on the shallow shelves that border any lake and pond. Water coming into the pond is filtered by these plants. This is a good thing. They work well. But the problem with littoral shelf plantings is that fluctuating water levels will sometimes create very hard living conditions. If it is too low, the plants will die because there is not enough water. If the water rises and causes the plants to go underwater, they can't survive either. These solutions are good, but cannot keep up with an unhealthy stormwater pond. We have devised a new way to significantly reduce nutrient levels in water. This new system utilizes a patented floating wetland technology we call BMATs. What are BMATs? BMATs are an active biological system that utilizes macrophytes to remove pollution from stormwater. As previously stated, macrophytes typically grow on the shoreline. But now, we figured out a way to float these macrophytes out into the middle of the pond where the macrophytes can be most effective, taking up nutrients directly from the water column rather than the soil. With roots hanging below the island, they can grow up to 18 inches long, forming an underwater organic matrix. The roots harbor an array of microorganisms called biofilm. Within the biofilm, beneficial bacteria fixate certain nutrients, while zooplankton eats phytoplankton. There's no soil involved in our floating system, which leaves the plants free to take nutrients exclusively from the water. So this directly competes with the phytoplankton, reducing its food source. Here are some examples of what BMETs can do. First, at Patrick's Air Force Base in eastern Florida, there were two side-by-side -side ponds receiving the same amount of water from the same source. This one received two BMETs, and this one was left untouched. Over time, BMETs cleared the first pond, while the other became algae-ridden. Another example was demonstrated at Church Street Pond in Miko, Florida. This neighborhood pond was receiving stormwater runoff from the surrounding area. The pond developed a very bad duckweed problem. Duckweed thrives on very high nitrates. In this situation, BMATS did an amazing job of removing the nitrates from the water and wiped out the source of food for the duckweed. The last example took place in Naples, Florida. This pond was dominated by algae and nuisance hydrilla. This was a very choked out system that fish were having trouble surviving in because of shading problems. Bee mats and aerators were installed into the stormwater pond and the water column cleared up within a few short months. Bee mats are also a great source for wildlife habitat both underneath and above the water. And in this saltwater pond in New Smyrna Beach, Florida, you can see that spoonbills, egrets, and herons alike all use this place to fish and nest. 
Stormwater ponds are not easy to fix, but they can be maintained with proper management. Bee mats are an effective tool to help keep our stormwater ponds healthy. Thank you for your time and please call Bee mats or visit our website at www.bmats.com. Thank you.